This is how we see you in September. Welcome to First and Finest. I'm Russ Eisenstein, the voice of the Ohio Bobcats. This is episode two. A lot of shows might have been canceled after the first episode, but not us. We rise above the rest. Coming up, Athletic Director Julie Cromer will have a visit with the leader of the band, Dr. Richard Sook. We'll visit with a cat turned cult, TJ Carey, and we'll cover three with Rob Cornelius, Jason Arkley, and I as we talk about the current state of play in college athletics and give you some interesting stories from road trips past. But we'll start off this month with the infotainment that you need, the facts and the fun that will go through it all. But we'll talk about a very serious topic when it comes to the coronavirus and college athletics with two guys that know about it very, very well. We welcome in Ohio's longtime athletic trainer, John Bowman, and the uh, Dean of the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine at Ohio University, Dr. Kenneth Johnson. Gentlemen, good to see you both. Let's start it off with where we're at right now, the current state of play when it comes to the virus in relationship to college athletics. John, let's start with you. Well, thanks, Russ. It's good to be here today. Um, where we are right now with our conference is uh, uh, we are not competing this fall. Um, we we do have uh, our teams, some of our teams coming onto our campus now to start their training uh, and practice in preparation for having a season later this year. Uh, uh, with our fall teams, hopefully uh, in, in the early part of 2021, that's our hope to be able to get that up and running. And then our winter teams are, will be uh, reporting here very soon with the idea that we, you know, we're, we're on track to try to get them ready to play again this winter. So um, that's where we are presently. Uh, we, our, our kids have had a long break, uh, you know, not looking for sympathy. It's tough on everybody. It's tough on family members. It's tough on people losing jobs. It's, it's tough on, uh, on everybody across the world and, and it's certainly in our country. But, you know, uh, my job is to take care of our, uh, our 400 student athletes. And so that's my world. And knowing that a lot of those kids have had to do something they've never had to do, and that is shut down. And so we, we're trying to get them up and running uh, and physically getting them back into shape. And, and it's taken some time to do that. And we're trying to do that in the safest manner possible. Dr. Johnson, what sticks out to you as to where we are right now? And as a disclaimer, this is being taped on August the 28th, the Friday, August the 28th, mid-afternoon. And I say that because this is what we know right now, dealing with the facts and the plans as of right now, and everything can change. And with that in mind, Dr. Johnson, what sticks out to you when it comes to this pandemic, the virus in relation to college athletics? Yeah, Russ, you know, I was thinking, I'm glad that the disclaimer was mid-afternoon because late afternoon, it will change. Uh, and I think that's one been one of the most difficult things on in managing this. And as Chief Medical Affairs Officer for Ohio University, I've been partnering with athletics in the preparation for returning students and keeping students on in athletics. And uh, I've been on the phone many times with John where we're just about having a plan complete and then we have to change it on because everything changes so quickly. So I've been really proud of our response actually on in what we've been doing to keep it not only athletes, but uh, Ohio University and the community safe. Um, the hardest thing of this is that this is a new virus on um, it's a uh, you know that we don't have a lot of experience with and I would have lost a lot of money multiple times betting on this because it just changes so quickly on um, I think Ohio's done a really phenomenal job on um, with its athletes and the preparation and also on uh, helping them to be on uh, to be safe on um, and we've worked very very hard across the university here now uh, to try to create a, uh, a safe environment for, for everybody and including our community. And that's the important point here too, Dr. Johnson and, and, and John, when we talk about all of this, it, you've dealt with plans when it comes to opening up a new uh, athletic year, academic year at Ohio, but everything changes with this virus now. So those plans you might pull from your experience, but it's it's brand new now. So John, let's talk about the plan and the correlation of dealing with the virus, this hopefully preparation for college athletics, um, all plans seem to be out the window and you really had to read, react and adapt as this all moved forward currently now and, and in the future. Yeah, certainly. I mean, we, and Dr. Johnson has been working on this. He's never stopped working on this <laughs> since, since it started back in February and early March. Uh, 
but for, but for athletics, you know, we, we really started hammering out a plan on how in April, uh, following the governor and, uh, and uh, the CDC and, and the NCAA. Uh, so we really had actually at one point, we have five, five regulate, regulators. You're going to have to help me with that one, Russ, uh, that we had to, had to uh, uh, work under, you know, Ohio University, the MAC, the NCAA, and of course, the CDC in the state of Ohio. And so uh, in April, we started with that and um, started to put down our plan of what what's the first steps. And uh, the first steps would be getting a few student athletes into our weight room and it, lifting and running things that we could manage, things that they could social distance naturally. Uh, and, and it can be done in, in areas that we can clean the facility. Um, uh, and athletes could have PPE such as masks and, and so forth. And so um, that's how it started. And, and um uh, she, like Dr. Johnson said, I mean, it seemed like every day there was just new data coming out. There was changes. There was, CDC was working very, very hard, but they were getting new information to us constantly. And, and uh, so, yeah, so the NCAA responding and the MAC responding and, and the governor uh, and his press conferences were, were uh, um, something that became daily habit for us to watch those every day because it was giving us so much information. So. All of that going into it, and uh, that's where we started in June, and we were really hopeful in June. Um, we were hopeful as we were opening back up as a society. I think the the verbiage that our, our team physician and Dr. Johnson and I were, how do we live with this virus? Let's let's see if we can live with the virus. Can we get back to doing the things that we need to do as to be uh, to be an American and uh, you know to be in a university employee and to be a father and all those things? And how do we do that safely? And we had a lot of optimism. And then over the summer, uh, the virus continued to grow and spread through uh, uh, summer activities and social interactions and so forth. And and uh, it became, you know, it became apparent that this wasn't going to go away. And uh, we and then, you know, working out and lifting and running is is certainly something that we can manage very safely with our students. Uh, but then it got into how do you compete? You know, how do you take your football team on the road uh, to, to a, another school in another state. And, and, and it got really complicated, quite frankly. Uh, there are some states that wouldn't let you in unless you quarantine for 14 days coming in. There was another state that said you had to have, um, to get out of the quarantine, you'd have to have two PCR tests with a 24 hour break between. Uh, testing was difficult to get, uh, particularly for asymptomatic people in July. Um, so it was making it difficult for us to feel like we could manage uh, our teams, our volleyball team, our soccer team, football team, being able to test them, travel them, have other teams travel here from out of state, um, all of those things. There was a lot of a lot of difficulties with that, and I think that's where it came apparent that uh, probably uh, being prudent here and and not competing um, was was the decision our conference made. And Dr. Johnson, uh, to uh, dovetail off of uh, John's point here, the the phrase the virus is going to tell us, the virus is going to dictate a lot of things. We as human beings have uh, this inherent uh, uh, nervousness or or, or um, uh, agitation in us where, oh, we've been sitting around for too long, it's time to move, it's time to move. Well, in a lot of cases in science and in medicine, the, the virus is going to dictate that and the virus doesn't care about uh, our need to be on the move and to fix things and change things now. So when it comes to plans, um, you've had to work with medical professionals to be adaptable through all of this. And as John had mentioned, it's not just an Ohio thing. This is in relation to our connectivity to uh, everywhere else in college athletics and in our region as well. So decisions made here um, have an impact on decisions made elsewhere too. So when it comes to our connectivity to the rest of the community, Southeast Ohio and the university, athletics has to play a part in that and everyone has to work in concert, don't they? Yeah, you know, Russ, I, I really like, um, you know, your what you opened with before, which was read and react. And the other one that comes to mind is like curveballs and we're being thrown curveballs on left and right with this. You know, there's a paradox here, a paradox for higher ed, a paradox for athletics when it comes to this virus. So um, what we know about this virus is that it spreads very easily. On in that to, um, to help prevent that, you have to keep people apart. Well, higher ed brings people together, athletics brings people together. Um, and so it's managing that paradox and how do you do that? Um, and in this case here, how do you continue an athletics program under that um, one level of uncertainty, but then two under that, um, you know, kind of like the guideline of 
social or physical distancing and all the other things that you need to do to be able to actually manage and continue to move things along. And we're having to create things we've never had in place before, policies, protocols, on uh, et cetera. And then, learn, you know, you're kind of read and react. We're doing that every day, which is we have a policy or protocol in place. We've never done it. We start doing it and then we read, react, change and modify. And on, you know, John and I are on the phone multiple times on per week on doing that kind of read and react and trying to manage the paradox of this of this virus um, that we have. And I like what John said about, you know, being an American, being a father on um, et cetera. This is personal on um, for me in so many different ways. So as a physician, um, you know, my goal is to take care of our community. I've always my role has always been taking, particularly here in Southeast Ohio, caring for those people that need it the most on um, here. Um, I, I have a double bobcat on family with two kids on, and I have to say that on my boss on at home on tells me that it's my job to keep our kids safe on as part of that. And it's really all of us working together to try to figure out how do we do that? How do we operate? How do we keep moving forward? How do we not have this virus stop us from doing the things that are really important to us, but doing it in the safest way possible on um, and to be able to continue uh, to move forward and not, uh, you know, not let physical distancing or, you know, social distancing stop us from being able to move forward. And that's that's a very important part there. Bobcats all over and having that tie to this university and this region. And John, you, your wife, your kids, you're all Bobcats. Uh, Dr. Johnson, of course, uh, kids in school and, and, and as the Bobcat head of, of, of a college here, it all matters. And that's a partnership with Ohio Health as well and being good stewards for this region, too. I, I, I think that Bobcats can, can lead change in a lot of ways and can also set the standard when it comes to health in, in Southeast Ohio. Uh, John, I, I know you believe in that very strongly. Yeah, very much. Our, you know, our relationship with Ohio Health started in 1988 uh, when it was just Grant Hospital and uh, Dr. Ray Tesner, and uh, he be, he was our uh, our team orthopod uh, back then, and it's grown ever since. And we've been we've been uh, uh, so fortunate. Ohio Health has come down to Southeast Ohio uh, a number of years ago and uh, established a formal relationship here in our community, and. Um, um, having having uh, those folks uh, readily available for us, they've been a great resource. You know, we, we've we've had to, we're not just making this up on the fly. I mean, we've reached out to the infectious disease uh, uh, department at Ohio Health. They've been a great resource for our committee in, in discussing policy and how to, how to, I guess, navigate through this, Dr. Johnson, I guess that would be the way I would say we're, what we're trying to do here. Um, but uh, so it's been it's been uh, more than just uh, obviously for me in working with our local ortho orthopedic group and Dr. Sergio Uoa and Fred Solomon and those guys uh, who are, are the life and blood of, of our for our student athletes. But it's been so much more than that. It's been their administration in the hospital and and uh, everybody up up Route 33 all the way up to Columbus. It's been great to have them as a as a partner. Yeah, and that's the linkage between not only the athletic community, uh, but the student population as a whole. But this impacts more than than 18 to 22 year old student athletes. There, there are people here that are involved in athletics from a working capacity, from a fan capacity. So none of this occurs within just an isolated bubble of the team. There are a lot of connected parts here. And, and uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, you helped to forge that Ohio Health Partnership as well. And, and being in the community in Southeast Ohio, as, as you see the new green as well with the new building going up on campus too, uh, it's certainly leaving a, a, an impression and, and a mark when it comes to this virus and hopefully being able to figure it out, not only for the school, but for the region too. Yeah, you know, Russ, one of the things building off of what John was saying, in 2011, Ohio University named Ohio Health a, pre a preeminent partner. Um, we opened a campus in Dublin, on, and actually here in Athens, we opened on about five years ago, the Ohio Health Physician Group Heritage College, the on official practice plan of Ohio University, where our sports medicine physicians are physicians within that practice. So we've been continuing to evolve our relationship and from my perspective, the way that we care for athletes, for the college, the university, and the community is through partnership. And that partnership has been phenomenal. And um, one of the evolutions of that is that in this pandemic, uh, just this week, uh, we started 
a process where Ohio, you, there's an 800 number, a toll free number that anybody can call. It's a faculty, staff or student questions or concerns about COVID on in Athens on there is a site where people can be tested right on campus on if they qualify um, with the symptoms they'll be case managed on through that back to on work back to school back to play on as uh, as part of that and it's a further evolution of this relationship that we have and we triangulate that in so many different ways with athletics with county public health with our preeminent partner on all of us coming together trying to figure out the answers to something that the world hasn't seen since 1918. I mean, it's the last time we saw a worldwide pandemic on uh, and with all of us working together, we're trying to get those answers on uh, and I feel I feel so proud of that partnership that we have because that I think helps us to get the the most right answer uh, that we can. And now we have a, a process in place where Anybody, you know, just a it's a quick phone call away on uh, to try to get the answers that you need to help keep you safe. Well, to wrap it up, I, I guess we could talk for an hour about what needs to happen, what can happen, what are the possibilities here. But um, it, it, in a, a fairly Reader's Digest uh, version of your thoughts, if you could, uh, John, I'll, I'll start with you and, and Dr. Johnson, you can follow. Um, what needs to happen in these next couple of weeks, in this next month, to be able to get to the point where Bobcats will allow for everyone to stand up and cheer again, for play to, to get back and resume, start all of that? What needs to happen not only uh, here, but also across the college landscape to get us there? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, there's not an easy, an easy answer to that right. question at all. Um, it's a combination of things. I think we need to see uh, the states decreasing the, the percentage, the number of tests, the uh, number of positives they're having, number of cases need to go down, continue to go down. Um, possibly more testing available for the athletes as uh, I think that's when, if we're going to get to a point where when we're competing uh, for each team to feel comfortable to compete with one another, to have them tested on a frequent basis, um, which that is becoming more available but still not, you know, I, I, it's, and that's an issue for everybody. I mean, we, we want, we are sensitive to that. I want to say that here, Russ, on this interview, um, you know, Ohio athletics is sensitive to the fact that there's people in this community that need tests. And, and so we are uh, working with Ohio health and being a good partner and to not uh, to take on too many uh, to be, to be a um, self-serving, I guess is the word, you know, uh, we want to be a good community member there. So, but at the same point in time, as 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 more testing options become available, uh, cheaper or more economical, and uh, and and uh, um, the results get back quicker, then then I think that can can make a, a playing field that you can feel comfortable in taking a team from Ohio to New York or from New York to Ohio and in Massachusetts and and all those things that go into play with it. Um, that, that's the difference between us and the high schools, you know, and, and, and transporting them and moving them around from state to state. Uh, that's the biggest difference. And, and so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. John didn't mean to cut you off there, but, okay. but absolutely. Yeah. You, you, there are so many parts here. And, and to be fair, that that's unfair of me to ask the question <laughs> of a reader's digest version of what needs to happen here, because as, as you start going down that path, you think of all of these other things that need to be mentioned. It's not easy, Dr. Johnson, and, and, and John is, is absolutely correct in, in going down all of those uh, uh, paths to, to try to get us to the point where we can play again. Yep. And you're managing it from a from a university and regional standpoint too, John. Uh, but but your your thoughts, Dr. Johnson, on what needs to happen now yep. moving forward to get us back there? Yeah. So so building off of what John said, definitely the decrease in cases that we're seeing in the state. I think there's two game changers for us. On um, one would be if we had testing as easily available as going to any local pharmacy and getting an early pregnancy test. Uh, and if we had that level of testing available where anybody has just a question and you can get an answer like that, and um, that's game changer one. Game changer two is a vaccine being available. We know we're months off on from that. So we're not gonna see that in the near future, but those two factors I think would be true game changers in our ability to respond on, and going back to your read and react, on we would just be able to do so much more so quickly if we had those two things in place. 
Well, gentlemen, I, I can't thank you enough for the time, but also for uh, all that you're doing, not only for Ohio athletics, but Ohio University and, and for Southeast Ohio and really the state and the country, too. We we depend on on you all for being able to get this done. And, and I know you're doing your part. And so I can't thank you enough for the time and, and all that you do as well. Thanks, Russ. You know, what I often say is that it's not easy, but it is definitely worthy. Uh, and so it keeps me uh, going every single day. Thanks, Russ. That's Dr. Kenneth Johnson, the Dean of the, Osteopath uh, the Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine at Ohio University, and Ohio's athletic trainer, John Bowman. When Travis T.J. Carey played for the Bobcats, he had nine interceptions, three sacks, and a punt return touchdown. That turned into a pro career that started back in his home state of California with the Raiders. And then he turned to a Brown, and now he's an Indianapolis Colt. The cool idea here is to pair a current Bobcat with a Bobcat legend. So Bobcat running back Julian Ross got to visit with T.J. Carey. Well, Fred, I just wanted to say thank you for coming on, obviously. But, I mean, you know, for who you are, we know who you are. You play for Indianapolis Colts. Last season you had over with the – uh, Cleveland Browns, you have 40 solos, four tackles for losses, like stuff we can Google. But yeah. I mean, you know, I just want to know, if we want to know just who you are, like outside of outside of football, just who you are, tell us about yourself. Yeah, man. Um, man, I'm a father. Um, man, I'm a sibling, um, a husband, man. And um, I'm, I'm very passionate about what I do, right? And one of the biggest things that I try to instill in athletes, youth, teens, is, is just the ability to believe and dream, you know? And that was one of the biggest reasons why we created the foundation, the TJ Carey Foundation, um, because I was a recipient, recipient of heart disease. You know, I had open heart surgery when I was 16 years old. Um, was told I would never play the game of football again, and I'm going on my seventh year. So everything we do, man, is to inspire, encourage, and to give the ability um, to, to dream and imagine that those things can happen. Anything that you put your mind to can happen, right? And so we pride ourselves on doing that with the foundation, visiting a number of kids, youth. Um, we started to teach our financial literacy program too, to minority groups. So we, we try and, I try and instill as much as I can into the youth, man, because when I was coming up, there was someone doing it for me. So I, I'm a big believer of paying it forward and um, continuing to stay humble and give, 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 man. That's one of the biggest believers of myself. Yeah. So what, what made that just become like a passion for you? Has it always been something for you? Or that just become, you know, once you got to that level, you're like, hey, let me just go ahead and pay this forward. Yeah, um, man, it was really watching up growing and, and kind of seeing it. You know, I'm, I, I'm a sibling, like I said, I have four, four brothers. I'm the fourth, mm. um, so three older. And um, one of the biggest things that I learned from them was, just the ability to pass down the knowledge each and every year, right? My oldest brother did it to my second oldest and my second oldest did it to my third. By the time it was me, I, I had a chance to really experience all the life lessons that they had at a really young age because they were able to pay that information forward and tell me like, hey, watch out for this. So you need to be working on this. We need to be doing those things, right? So just at the home space, the way I was grown, um, really gave me that opportunity to learn a lot of those valuable characteristics that I, that I carry now. And so those are some of the things that stuck with me. And when I got that opportunity to put myself in a position to pay it back forward to everyone around me, I, I dove f first into it. Right. And so I think now, nowadays, you know, it's, it's more of a, a, a true passion that I try and sometimes I have to pull myself back because I'm so invested into some of those things that I still have to keep the main thing, the main thing, right? Which is yeah. ball, right? Balls yeah. what, what gave me the ability to do those things. So those are some of the things that uh, me and the team constantly work on. Yeah. That's amazing. That's actually great that you have that plan. I know myself and, you know, my roommates and, you know, team is all we try to make sure we focus on and kind of pass down that knowledge to others, even if it's on our teammates, you know, just, Make sure that you know, let them realize that ball isn't, for, you know, forever. You know, just have have that knowledge of just knowing that you know there's more to just life. But use ball to get to that next level of stage. Right. And so right. I think that's the best part about it, honestly. Yeah. But, 
And and that's the thing, man. Um, you're a person, right? Ball is what you do. It's not who you are, man. So, you know what I mean? You are your own person. You have your own beliefs. And, you know, yes, my, my job and my profession is football, right? But I'm still a person. I still have other dreams and, and aspirations and goals outside of football, right? That make me who I am as a person. So always carry that, man, with you. And never let anyone box you into the corner and making you think that, oh, you're just an athlete and nothing more than that, right? You're talented, you're smart in other avenues. And the things that we learn in ball, man, carry over to the workplace in so many other avenues. Yep. Yeah. I 1,000% agree with you on that one. Yeah. But from an athlete standpoint, you know, as athletes, there's always been that moment, you know, that we in a game or in practice or whatever that we'll never forget. You know, yeah. it might be embarrassing, funny, whatever, but what's that first moment, you know, that, that just hits your head once you think about, you know, a game back at Ohio or something like that? Um, what was one of the first moments, man, that uh, – oh, man. So, uh, we were – it was homecoming. And um, I want to say this was my sophomore year. And I was playing punt return. Where I think we were playing – might have been Akron. I can't remember. And um, we're up, we're winning. It's about two minutes left in the game, right? I'm playing punt return. And um, all we had to do was get the ball back and take a knee in the game. And so I'm on the field and coach is yelling at me. Frank is yelling at me. I can't really understand what he's saying, but he's yelling at me. So I'm looking at him, but I'm still trying to watch. So the ball's punted. They come down. Screaming in my face, I drop the ball. Oh. And they get the ball on the 40-yard line. Right. And you could hear the whole crowd go, oh, <laughs> damn. Right? And so in my mind, I'm thinking, like, wow. Like, did I really just lose the game for it? You know what I mean? And so they get the ball. They still got to go. They still need a touchdown. So I'm like, all right, get my mind back. But that at that point, the whole team was deflated. Right. And so they go down and score win the game. So I come off to the sideline. Coach was like, I was trying to tell you that you didn't have to catch the ball. <laughs> you could have just let it bounce. Yeah. And so, man, that day, you know what I mean? This is homecoming. You know, it's a big game, man. Yeah. You know, every after every homecoming, you got the parade and all the other stuff. Man, I went after the game, I stayed in the locker room for three hours and cried, man. And uh it was bad because my my girlfriend, my, my wife slash girlfriend at the time, she waited the whole three hours outside. Oh, yeah. So I was hurt, man. I was hurt. We didn't go out. We didn't do nothing. And I was embarrassed, man, because, you know, everyone's watching this, this big stage. And um, we lost homecoming off of, you know, a mistake that I made. So yeah. that's something that it was truly embarrassing, man. Yeah. Oh, man. I think you kind of recovered from that. I ain't gonna lie, but you're good now. But that's good that you know your wife. She stayed. She stuck through you with that. That's a real one right yeah. there, for Joe. But you know, speaking of, speaking of Coach Solit, so back then, how was he? You know, give it a little quick explanation about how he was. Man, you know what, Frank the Tank. I always call him Frank the Tank. Frank the Tank. That's um, what I call. <laughs> yeah, he man. He to me, he he was always calm and collective. Man, it took a lot for Coach Solis to to really scream and yell. One thing that always surprised me, though, was how strong he was, right? And I never really understood it and until some days I would catch him. And you would have to catch him at odd times in the gym working out, man. But he was in there pumping out some curls, you know, doing some bench press. And uh, one time he hit me with a little jab. I'm like, oh, shucks. Yeah. You know, this he, he kind of strong. So yeah. um, he was cool, man. I, I love Coach Solis. He was one of the people that really believed in me and, me and him had a lot of heart to heart conversations with, you know, just being there in my career at uh, OU, you know, I had a lot of ups and downs and he was always one of the, the first people I would go to and, and just sit in dialogue with and get his perspective on coach. Like, this is what I'm thinking. What do you feel? And he would give me the real honest answer. Like, this is what I feel. This is the perception you're going to get from the team. But if you come back and do these things, you'll be good. Yeah. And um, I remember one year, uh, my junior year, going into my junior year, I asked Coach Solich, I said, man, look, I think I need to go train with my brother in the summer instead of staying for summer workouts. And he was like, um, you know, I don't really think that's a good idea. Like, what about school? And what about you building that chemistry with your team? And at that time, I had already 
I was ahead of all my classes. So I'm like, coach, you know, I, I took extra classes just for this situation. I said, I think I'll be better for the team if I come back and be the best me. And he let me go. I came back. And at that, my junior year was one of the best years I had in college. I was ranked like number 15th corner in the, in the um, NCAA after that year. And um, that year, they were telling me, like, you should go straight to the NFL right now. Like, don't come back your senior year. And so um, those are just the understanding moments that Coach Sullivan really shared. Yeah. He does. He's great. I, 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 I catch him running the stairs still. What? So he, yes. Oh, he's he on that. He's still that. Yes. He's still Frank the Tank. I call him, but oh, man. Of it, he did mention, you know, the lows and, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, just the highs of all the athletes and what we go through, but yeah. not a lot of people pay attention to our lows, you know, you know, your career, my career, everyone's has experienced those lows, and but, you know, that the mental drain it has on us, you know, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, man. Um, my, I had a tough college career, man. I came in um, my freshman year. Um, I got put on academic probation because I was partying. I didn't really know the schedule and, you know, going to classes and, you know, in the winter, I didn't really take advantage of those things. And at that point, at that point in time, you know, it was really my coach telling me like, look, man, you got an opportunity that far few uh, athletes or students period get, you know what I mean? And don't blow it on um, things that will still be there years after college. Right. And so, um, Coach Brown, he's one of my first coaches I had up there, and he he really instilled that in me at a young age. And so after that year, you know, I really kind of got my act right, got back on grades and, and really start focus, focusing more. But then I had like four surgeries in college, man. You know what I mean? Like I had a rough college career, and every every time that I came back from a surgery was always something, right? Like after that junior year um, where, you know, my coaches were telling me you should leave, I decided to stay in that next – my going into my senior year in camp, I tore my shoulder again. Mm. And I was, like, missed the whole year. And so it was – you know, at that point in time, I, I really thought to myself, like, man, is it is it worth it? Like, do I still play? You know, I've had a hip surgery. I've had two shoulder surgeries. You know what I mean? Like, at that time, it was just so much going on. And mentally, I was not there. And yeah. I think that's a, a struggle that a lot of athletes battle with, you know, not even just injuries, but, you know, grades and family issues that you have back home, man. It, I mean, it's, it's draining. Um, and you still having to put on a face to go out there and compete every day. You know what I mean? So it's definitely hard, man. And I think that you have to, to, to build a good friendship group around you, man. And, and a lot of my teammates was those, people that held me up and, and continued to encourage me and didn't really allow me to feel like an outcast when I was hurt. You know what I mean? So definitely built from that, man. And it's, it's no easy task. There's no easy, easy road. There's no shortcuts, man, to achieving anything that you want to do in life, man. Work is the only recipe. And if you're willing to work and you're willing to sacrifice in order to um, get to where you want to be, you can, but I mean, there's no easy path, right? You know what I mean? So um, it was hard and it's hard. It's always hard. It's never easy. For sure. So, you know, throughout the adversity, like how did you feel like that would affect your journey toward, towards the NFL? That I know that was still a passion of yours, some of you were pursuing. So how do you feel like that affected you? Um, you know, I think it affected me because it really allowed me to focus more on my body going into the NFL because, um, you know, so much in college, you really – you don't really have the resources to take care of your body as much, but you have some of the understanding of, you know, the importance of stretching and rolling out and doing little things like that. Right. But you don't really, you don't really think of it too much because you're young. Right. And so when I stepped into um, on my path to this, I started realizing that I needed to do little more things that not necessarily were um, demanding of my body, but really just allowed me to continue to stay in shape. And so at home, I really built a workout regimen at home where, you know, I was doing like yoga and insanity and, you know what I mean? Little things that college athletes, you don't really think about, you know what I mean? But I really started planning my life around if I'm going to achieve what I want to achieve, like these are the things that I had to do. And I had plenty of roommates and you can ask my roommates, they would come home and I'm, I'm in there doing insanity drenched and like, 
bro, we just had practice two hours ago. And I'm like, yeah, man, but I need this, you know what I mean, to keep my body where it needs to be. And so um, those are some of the things that I really, you know, really found myself doing through the adversity to keep my mind sound on where the ultimate goal was, right? Never in, it, in, in, in what you want to achieve is it a sprint. It's always a marathon. You know what I mean? And that marathon is going to go up, down, sideways, left, right. You know what I mean? So you have to, as long as the goal is the goal and the main thing is the main thing, you get there. Now, in God's plan, you get there in his time, not yours. Right? Yeah. I, I agree with you on that. You know, for sure. Path, you know, it's, it's there, but just, take, just be patient with it. For sure. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. You know, back, back, kind of back up to it. But throughout your time in Athens, I know uh, it's a beautiful place, a crazy place. So you got to tell me, you know, what, what, was, what, what was the spot on court street for you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> man, Brownies was the spot, man. Was the spot. Okay. Brownies was the spot, man. I know, I know we would always go there and they had the wings on deck, too. Um, Brownies was the spot. I yeah. love Bronies. Uh, the burrito buggy. I don't know if they still got the burrito buggy yeah. here, but the burrito Dude, buggy. I ain't had it yet. It's, it's good. The buggy was lit, man. And uh, I'm about to get it right. You're going to have to do that. It's, it's crazy. I think uh, Junction, I think that one's closed. I don't know. Um, but they used to have a cotton club. They don't have that no more. That was the, man, that joint was popping. Uh, that was like the Thirsty Thursdays. Yeah. Uh, so it's a couple of joints up there that still, like I said, man, Bronies, I don't know how Bronies is now, but Bronies was always the spot, man. It was kind of like the more grown style spot that you had to attend. So, but those are the things, man. Those are the days. Those are the days, man. And, uh, I love it, man. I try to get back there as much as I can. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now that you kind of, you know, forward on in your life, what are some things that you look back on that you probably could have changed, you know, that you would kind of give advice to, you know, either athletes, other athletes that are here in the program or just, you know, just, you know, people themselves, you know, as they go throughout their career in college or, you know, in sport as well. Yeah. Always do extra. Always do extra, man. 10 minutes, no matter what it is, you know, no matter what you're, you're studying or what you're, what you're trying to achieve, man, t- just do 10 minutes every day. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and that's what I pride myself even to this day now. I still do the same warm up routine that I've done for the last eight years. You know what I mean? So, and after practice, I always do 10 minutes of something, whether that's 10 minutes of feet work, hand work, catching balls, you know, doing drills, you know what I mean? Working on stretching 10 minutes because by the time you add those 10 minutes up, man, they become hours, right? And those hours then become days. And so if you prize yourself on always doing a little bit of extra every day, man, you'll, you'll achieve and outwork a multitude of people throughout your lifetime. And yep. so those are the biggest things that I would, that's one of the biggest things that I would pride myself on going back and telling somebody if I was in that position again, 10 minutes every day. Yep. You no, know, I just want to say thank you for coming on. Man. I know you busy, a busy man, you know, no but, problem, baby. We really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate talking with you and, you know, giving out some advice, but you know, talking about your adversities and everything that you had in life. But, you know, I really appreciate it also. Man. For sure, man. For yeah, sure. Anytime, man. Much love, man. Much oh. love. Kill it out there this year, man. Do whatever oh, yeah. you need to do. Yes, sir. And, and, and have a mind frame of where you want to go. And anything that stops you from that mind frame, eliminate it. Yeah. Get it out, get it out your roadblock. You feel what I'm saying? Don't let that thing um, take focus on what you really want to do in life, man. And always understand, man, you can do anything in your mind, you can put your mind to. You feel what I'm saying? Much love, man. Appreciate it, Julian. For sure. I appreciate you. Thank you. On game day and every day, the Marching 110 bangs the drum for Bobcat tradition. It started off with 110 members. Now it's 110% effort. Either way, they're awesome. And Athletic Director Julie Cromer got to visit with the leader of the band, Dr. Richard Sook. Ricky, it's good to see you, my friend. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. How are you? I, I'm hanging in. I'm coming to you from the confines of our uh, dining room. As okay. you can see, there's a very fancy backdrop. Where are you? Are you in the office today? I'm in my office. My house is being painted now, and the painter's in my office at home. So I decided to go up to school and do it. So. so what's it like on campus on the third day of classes as we're recording this? Doesn't look like the typical no. first week of classes. I saw that a couple days ago when I was around. 
it's eerily quiet. It feels like the middle of the summer still, but uh, I have some online classes as well. So that part feels a little bit like last spring, but still feeling like summer, like middle of July outside. And I wish everybody was here. Thanks for, yeah. uh, I think, a better community. Yeah, it's missing. We're missing that fall energy from the students, I think. Uh, I bet you got a great parking spot, though. I did. I parked right up front. So. Yes, <laughs> park. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. The parking and we're moving through town a little bit easier, but I, I, we're, we feel the same way. You know, the convocation center um, really is best when it has the energy of our That's student right. athletes, you know, running around the hallways. So, so thanks for joining me. As I think we shared with you, we're just looking for ways to try to connect virtually, both um, with other leaders on campus, but also to give some of the folks who follow us an opportunity to hear a little bit more about uh, what else is going on on campus, but also maybe a little behind the scenes of some of their favorite parts of campus. And obviously the Marching 110 has quite the following. So we're honored that you would spend a little bit of time with us today and, and have a quick chat. Well, I appreciate you having me, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I, I have to say, you know, we know that you are the most exciting oh, band in the land. And I have certainly seen that for myself. I think a lot of people um, know why they think you're the most exciting band in the land. In your words, what do you think it is about the Marching 110 that lives up to the fame? I think each student brings to the band their uh, a, a sense of uh, commitment to the tradition. And, and with that comes passion. And if you ever, I would love for you to visit a rehearsal someday. You will not believe how hard these students work. And if you saw that, they invest that, that sweat equity in the product, just like your athletes do. And then they want a great performance that night. And so they really give it their all. And that's why we say they give 110%. So I think that's the things that make us, you know, more exciting than the average band. You know, I think that people want to see that. And, and it's more than just the dancing. That's a kind of a, culmination of things. But when we go away to a visiting uh, school, the second we step on the field, they react because it's a little bit different. It's a little more energy. The step is higher. The music might be uh, brighter and um, more relatable since it's mostly popular. So um, I think we have those things working for us to make us exciting. Yeah, I, I definitely have seen that. I've had an opportunity to attend one rehearsal as I recall, it was a fairly cold evening. A couple of us came out with hot chocolate toward oh, the end of the season last year. And one of the cool things that I remember seeing as we circled up and you know, kind of said some words with with your with your students was there were just there was such a strong culture, mm -hmm. uh, much like we see with our own teams. Everyone knew where they were supposed to be, even in the circle up at the end, which is less formal, and everyone kind mm -hmm. of collapsing in. You can see that your students kind of stayed within our sections. Mm -hmm. There was a certain cadence to what happens at the end. You had a few things that you said, a few of your other leaders did too. There were some very specific ways of um, clapping and acknowledging <laughs> the yeah. points that you made that are very clearly part of your culture as well. And then um, your students were really were really great and, and really you know kind and sweet to us. I think, as I recall, it was a little blustery that night. You know, we had hot chocolate flying everywhere and they were just um, so thankful and so appreciative. And, um, you know, it was it was really indicative, I think, of the culture you guys have, you know, within the band as well. Everyone knew their place and what they were part of. Well, thank you. That was that was a very sweet gesture. And thank you very much. And um, yeah, that was a cold night. Those matching games can be chilly. I was I, I like it on Tuesday. Oh, I'm sorry, on a Saturday afternoon at two. But that's just my two cents. <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> no, we appreciate it. And we're lucky that we have really strong student leadership. Um, and uh, we go through quite a bit of training with them. And they're great about making sure that uh, their sections are where they're supposed to be. And they get the music and fundamentals they need to execute uh, what we're going to do on the field that day. And um, and there's just this allegiance to their section and, and especially the band and really to Ohio University. Those those are they make very strong connections. And when they graduate, I see the alumni come back all the time and not not so much homecoming, but other times. And they're always wearing Ohio University gear. So I think when you're in a, in a sport or in a band or in a, a group that represents the university, I think you have a, a higher allegiance to that university. I agree. I agree completely. And it is really, a, I think, a, a lifelong affiliation. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, I know that we see you most of the time um, 
connected to football games and then, you know, on a smaller scale with our, with our basketball games. But I, you know, have learned in my year here that you guys are actually like a worldwide phenomenon. You, you've you performed all over the place. What's your favorite venue or site over the years? Which, what are the highlights to you, Ricky? There's been some special moments. And I remember some NFL games that are special. Um, uh, one was in 2000, uh, the Browns, started back up actually it was 99 the browns started back up in cleveland and it was their game against the ravens which were the old browns and so they invited us to to do the game and that was really special i thought and and then a couple of years later we were uh, we had been invited to play at the giants but then 9 11 happened and so that game worked out to be the first home game since uh the tragedy oh, wow. so uh we did pregame at halftime and it was it was just an amazing crowd and an amazing day. And uh, that was very special and, and nobody will, will forget that. And um, internationally, um, <laughs> I remember performing in, in Rome at, at the Vatican and uh, we were, we were uh, in St. Peter's Square and just the people hanging out of their windows and uh, some clergy. And I mean, we didn't see the Pope or anything, but it, and it was an impromptu really. I mean, the, uh, the police gave us, this is where you're going to be. And this is where the crowd will be. And we started playing and they just came and, and they just loved it. And uh, so um, I think that was bringing something truly American to, you know, a, a foreign land. And and I, I felt that it was a, a special performance there. Same thing when we, we did uh, France a few years later, we played at the, uh, well, I guess it's probably about an eighth of a mile from the uh, the Eiffel Tower. Um, I, I told Josh Boyer, who was my colleague, I said, let's be far enough away so that we can get the, the Eiffel Tower in the shot. You know? <laughs> that was beautiful, of course. And then the people just formed. And at the end, we actually didn't have a permit. We just started playing. And <laughs> here comes the police, you know, on their bikes. And I'm like, uh oh, what's going to happen here? And then they just started backing people up so that we'd have more room. And so oh. they operated. So, uh, but those those things are very special, and and more so for the students. Just like last year, we had that tragedy at, at Notre Dame, and all the posts on Facebook that day were pictures of students that were in the band then posted their yeah. pictures in the front of Notre Dame. So they have more of a connection with it. So I think it makes them a more worldly citizen, you know. So we were supposed to go to Japan this past year, but COVID wiped that out. So um, so I don't know what the next one's going to be. That kind of took a lot of fire out of me just doing that because it takes a lot of planning and organization, you know, through various constituents, especially uh, global opportunities. They work very hard in, on these trips. So. Um, but it has been a uh, they they've had great experiences. Rose Parade was amazing. The Macy's parades are amazing. So those are really special events that uh, it's a it's just a privilege to be in them. You know. I was going to ask you about the Japan trip because I had heard about that since my time um, here, and I wondered if you would have an opportunity. Is there a do over opportunity from the summer of the pandemic, or is that the kind of thing that cycles through once every so often, and you'll have to wait? another however many years before you can pull that back together? That, that's a really good question. I, I, a lot of it depends on this virus. You know, I don't know if it's going to go away or what part of it's going to go away. I know we probably couldn't do it in 21. Then we'd have to look at 22 and then getting the enthusiasm up and the uh, venues lined up again and the, uh, uh, the talking with, you know, whatever airlines or whatever that could work out deals and stuff. So it's just a lot of, time intensive planning and then there's a course that goes with it you know we were halfway through that course when we went uh, home so um i know there's students here that will probably not be in the band if that happens again unfortunately but uh um but the university was very good to those students and, and refunded any money they invested so um so they weren't out anything except for just the actual experience but uh it was it was pretty um you know, devastating, um, you know, from a, uh, from an emotional sense from the band when that happened, but, you know, it's part of what we deal with as a, a citizen on this earth, you know, things happen and, um, and hopefully someday we can, we can go there. Well, I, I, I'm disappointed for them because I think for some, it may have been a once in a lifetime opportunity. Oh. And I know in our conversations with our students about trying to figure out 
how COVID will impact their college bound time, whether that's cutting it short in some cases or extending it in others. We've been involved a lot, at least in our offices this week, talking about how many students might choose to come back for additional years to make up for the seasons that have been lost so far. And I wonder what's the opportunity for a student in your program? Is it simply a matter of being willing to spend that extra time in the university setting and coming back perhaps even with the additional tuition dollars or is there, are you on a clock like some of our student athletes are through the NCAA? How does that work for your students? We're on a, a self-imposed clock and that clock is <laughs> they, have, they have five years of eligibility. So right. we don't have an overarching thing. Uh, so, but I did say, tell them that this year doesn't count. So if they took it off, which a lot of them didn't, I mean, we have the same numbers. We had uh, the same number of students audition and, um, but there were a few that said, I'm going to, I'm not going to sign up for it because it's virtual or uh, I'm going to wait and come back in the spring if we march uh, to the band and sign up then. So, um, so their clock really just kind of pauses, I guess you'd say, and then sure. they pick up when they come back. So they do have an opportunity to opt out. Absolutely. As well. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know that they've been staying busy this summer. Some of my um, favorite social media has uh, come from, from your accounts. We <laughs> have watched a virtual rendition of Stand Up and Cheer that I think our governor even used in, in yeah. some of his outreach. But I have to tell you, my favorite was the virtual Marching 110 kitchen line. <laughs> um, I just thought that was really cool. How did moments like that come together? The first one, Stand Up and Cheer, was an idea of my colleague, Emily Talley. She wanted to do it and uh, on this app that was going around. And I, and I was like, how do we manage that many people on that app? Because I think it's built for like eight. And so I have uh, a student in town that was a media arts major. And I asked him, could you put something together like that? Um, and he didn't really know how to do it at the time, but he researched it and did it. And we just asked the students, hey, if you have your instrument at home, which what a lot of them didn't, of course, because they were all left here when they left. Um, if you want to record Stand Up and Cheer, uh, we gave them um, a, something to listen to that had us playing it so they could play along with it. And so we could all have the same time. And then he took it and just put it together, you know, different scenes. and. Um, and so that was cool. I wish we could have had more people. I think 40 did that. And uh, and then through an alumnus in the band, uh, knew the governor and pushed it on onto one of his COVID presentations. So that was nice. Uh, as far as the kitchen thing, that was a kind of a surprise. It was our percussion section leader, Josh Green, uh, who's from uh, Hebron, Ohio. And uh, he had done that. And uh, although that was pretty <laughs> clever, he's an excellent percussionists too and so uh that was one of those things that were unexpected and, and kind of went you know went viral so um you know it's hard to think of really creative things i mean this uh this format of zoom and, and uh these ensembles recorded ensembles are are fairly new um it's, I'm, I'm afraid unfortunately it's going to get fairly old after a while so we have to do new things and hopefully those new things is us actually one day being together again so right. i'm hoping that's uh, pretty soon we're all looking forward to that very much. What will fall look like for you and for your students, Ricky? I, you know, we're we're now planning, uh, we're training our fall students so that they can be ready to go in the spring, but we're also getting ready for winter sports. I definitely hope we'll see you um, in basketball season. That's what we're all trying to gear up for. Um, what's next for, for you guys this fall? And what does a fall semester look like for those students who did opt in for the Marching 110? Well, we have uh, 232 students on roll. Um, we're hoping to be a part of phase two. And um, th who knows, hopefully everybody behaves and we can get to that point. Um, but what I proposed and it, it received approval was to do a virtual rehearsals. And so uh, we have the field commander, we have quite a few students, upperclassmen living in town right now. And so we have our, uh, our we have marching section leaders and we have music section leaders. It's the field commander plus the music section leaders. We take them, teach them the march, teaching them the marching fundamentals. And then we live broadcast it on uh, YouTube live so they can watch it and, and march along with it. But it's also archived so they, they can go back and review it or 
if they're doing something else, I can come back and do it. Um, so that's a visual component. Uh, the musical component, I'm actually, I actually, before I called you, I just finished the proposal for it to have the music section leaders join them and us play and have some rehearsals together because we've let them, if they wanted to come to town and check out their instruments, we've let them so they can have an opportunity to play. And we've sent them some music um, digitally on PDFs as well. So um, we want to run some music rehearsals where they can listen along and hear the whole group play. We're talking maybe 30 kids play it and then they can play along or they at least can have it for reference and uh, whatnot. So just to get them excited about the music and then the visual aspect marching. And we're also teaching them a dance while we're doing this just so they can participate too at home. And we do stretches and everything else. And um, and then hopefully on the 28th, when we come together, we'll have to do socially distance show or whatever being, you know, 90 inches apart. And um, it'd be great if we could prepare some type of show and, and showcase it at, at Peden sometime to some socially distanced audience. I don't know how that would look, but I think it would be a great um, incentive for the students to want to get back uh, to work. Um, and then if we go forward in the uh, um, spring, I, I definitely hope there's football. So I think they want to do shows and, and cheer for the team and do all the things that they normally do in the fall and the, but, they, but we'll do it in the spring this year. So, um, Fingers crossed. <laughs> right. Well, like you said, you know, hopefully by then everyone will feel safer and a healthy environment. We will have, you know, uh, kicked COVID and be <laughs> on the other side of that. And if not, then at least know a lot more about the virus and be able Absolutely. to come together in a safe environment. I think that's what a lot of us are hoping for is just with a few more, you know, even weeks, but maybe months, we have an opportunity to get um, better testing options you know, learn more about the virus, have a better sense of how it may or may not impact particularly the 18 to 22 year old group that, you know, that we serve. And, um, and you know, hopefully we'll pull this together. I can't wait to see you guys and see what you come up with. It's fascinating <laughs> when we realize that there are a lot of different ways to do what we always thought we could only do one way. I hear right. you talking about training virtually and coming, you know, in, in, in small groups and trying to figure out how to pull this together. I know when you do, it'll be great, Ricky. Thank you oh, thank very you. much. I it's appreciate great to chat it. with you. This is the second installment of Cover 3 on First and Finest. I'm Russ Eisenstein, joined by Jason Arkley here in mm -hmm. Athens County. And Rob Cornelius is in one of my favorite places in the entire universe, Las Vegas, Nevada. Viva, Rob. How are you? Uh, traveling the world, it's uh, beautiful out here, completely uncrowded, uh, pleasant flights, trying to have a good time and stay safe, but uh, always, a, always a good town. Uh, Arkley, I, I think we're incredibly jealous of Rob right now to be out in yeah. Viva Las yeah. Vegas. Huh? Like, yeah, like I, I don't know if I've been outside uh, a 15, 20 mile radius in months uh, from, from where I live. So, uh, yeah, well, yeah, I, you can definitely count me as in the jealous camp. And that brings us to an interesting story before we get into the meat and potatoes of this installment of Cover 3. Uh, Rob, we've done Vegas together uh, back in 2010-11 basketball season in which Ohio was absolutely rock chalked by Kansas and the Morris Twins, but got the win over Santa Clara a couple of days later. But uh, yeah, that one was interesting to say the very least. Oh, well, you remember Ohio was coming off that uh, obviously fantastic run in the 09-10 season, unexpected into Providence, unexpected big win in terms of the biggest ever over Georgetown. But the Morris Twins had a different opinion of that Georgetown squad and Ohio's accomplishments, and they expressed themselves um, pretty specifically in that game. Uh, they did, uh, to be sure. And, uh, hey, got the win over Santa Clara and a bounce back. So uh, they rang the register out there. And it was a heck of a time. I'll never forget that trip. We could go on and on about that. But first, um, top of mind, this is an interesting time to be sure. Sports starting up, continuing. College football is going to happen and actually will have happened already once this goes out. Uh, there will be a college football game, Austin P and Central Arkansas at the historic Crampton Bowl uh, in Alabama. Um, but, uh, Arkley, I'll, I'll start with you. What's top yeah. of mind around this time when it comes to where we're at college sports-wise and the pandemic? 
it's it's a really unsettling t- like you can't count on anything at this point right uh it, late august we we had schools come back in session across the country and immediately thereafter there's uh positive test after positive test on campuses so you know you've got every college campus now weighing the benefits of pushing through and, and go ahead and trying to play these games versus uh sending students home and, and doing remote learning on their own campuses so it, it again it, for from for much of the last few months, everything has kind of been in this uneven territory. We, you know, can we count on this happening next week? Can we count on this happening next month? Uh, we can't. So uh, I, I think the college football season is going to follow that same path. You're, you're going to have some programs, maybe some additional conferences say, you know, this this doesn't make sense. So there's there's we we went down this path far enough. There's too much risk. Let's let's bottle up. And there's going to be others that forge on ahead. So. Uh, much like the the entire summer, uh, I think there's still a lot of unsettled or unanswered questions yet, even here uh, in, in early September. Rob, to you, top of mind. Yeah, it it's, 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 college, it's fits athletics and, and the pandemic right now. It's fits and starts, and it'll be like the way Major League Baseball handled this. Some teams are going to have no problem whatsoever. Other teams are going to end up taking weeks off here and there when they have guys ill or guys who test the wrong way before they can get it confirmed. Problem is with football, if you're trying to play, you can't then go and play six double headers and catch up like you're the Cardinals or the Yankees or the Marlins or one of those teams has gotten in trouble. So that will be a scheduling hassle and a problem for these these teams going forward. Yeah, no doubt about that. And and this is a, a time where we've got to start thinking about winter sports as well, in addition to setting things right. up in the spring. Uh, to to more lighthearted stuff. On the road with us, I think our fans have have seen through our social media presence and whatever else that we try to have as much fun as we can. Burn the candle at both ends is a statement I've said often. Infotainment, to be sure. And that Boise trip, Rob, you and I, we've done this a lot. We're we're veterans when it comes to picking the spots that we go to, uh, dinners, bars, being safe, all that stuff, combining with work, too. But Arkley was our guy in Boise as well. I, I think he had some fun with us, didn't he? Uh, some of the best pictures of the trip had Jason in that giant potato, the New Year's party. There was a lot, lot that he was involved in. It was kind of cool. Arkley, what did you think yeah. about the Russ and Rob road trip? Uh, it, it was interesting. Uh, of all the places and experiences I could have envisioned spending New Year's uh, Eve going into 2020, uh, hanging out with you two in downtown Boise, uh, was probably not on my uh, on my list of possibilities. You know, uh, going into that 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 month, so. But no, it was a great trip. I, I had a ton of fun. Uh, Boise is a really cool town. Um, uh, I had a chance to get out and, and walk it and, and try some different places and, and enjoy some of the nightlife. And and to me, you know, I, I, I have a new favorite mascot, the Potato Bowl mascot. His his whole vibe is just over the top and, and exactly what I'm looking for when I'm looking for a big costume character hanging out at a football game. So uh, yeah, yeah, all thumbs up all the way for me from uh, the, the trip to Boise. Yeah, Spuddy Buddy, the name. Spuddy, Spuddy Buddy, yes. Right. How can you not and, like Spuddy? Credit where credit is due, too, because I think I dragged you two to a place that, that wasn't necessarily your scene uh, for a, a New Year's Eve ring in the new year. But to your credit, I think you guys had some fun there, too, right? I didn't bring my period attire for the 20s flapper party <laughs> or whatever that was supposed to be. I don't think Spuddy Buddy has anything in his size or a top hat, but uh, we got away with it. Next time, Spuddy Buddy should be there, assuming there's still Mac Boys to tie in. And, and see, that's yeah, but, the part of it, too, because we we try to do as, as everything that we can to cover uh, the ball club, uh, do the things that we need to do, radio show, social media content, all of that. But, but a bowl trip really... Arkley and Rob, are, that's that's the epitome of burning the candle at both ends. In addition to seeing fans that were there, you know, Kalina West and her mom were, were in the booth with us for our radio show. Arkley, you're doing what you need to do, and, and Rob as well. That That's the epitome of bringing everything together for a Bobcat Bowl road trip. Yeah, and that's the thing. One of those trips, you're there three or four or five days, and the players of their commitments, some are practice, but some are, some are social, some are, you know, various charitable things they do when they're out there. But you have a lot of time, if you're not playing and not practicing, to see a lot of stuff. We try to get that in, in there for you. Yeah, Arkley, yeah, I'm it, glad it, that you enjoyed it. Yeah, one, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things we did get to do was go to a uh, Mountain West basketball game while we were out in Boise. Right, uh, I forgot about that, yeah. That. Yeah, um, so uh, I think – 
So Wyoming was in town to take on the Broncos. So yeah, uh, in in Boise is an under like like I said earlier, Boise is an underrated city, and and that's oh. I don't know if that's a place I'd go and spend like two weeks of vacation, but that's that's a great weekend. That's a great week long trip uh, f- for a lot of folks uh, tied into Ohio football. And and I know that f- from a staff standpoint, from a player standpoint. I think once everyone got there again, and because and, there's been some turnover since last time Ohio was right. there, uh, they, they found out, oh, yeah, this this works. This works for us. And uh, so, yeah, it was a great trip. Yeah, I was back to my roots a little bit with minor league baseball and, and being at Idaho State. And it was great to be there with Rob again as well, much like we did in 2011. And arguably, it was great to have you in the fold as well. Yeah. And boom, there's another edition of Cover 3 with Rob Cornelius, Jason Arkley, and I'm Russ Eisenstein. This is First and Finest. So that's it for our second installment of First and Finest for the month of September. Let's take this pandemic, this virus, incredibly seriously as we move forward into October. What's the future going to hold? We don't know. But we need to be able to work together to be able to figure it out, to be able to stand up and cheer at Peden Stadium, at the Convocation Center, and every one of our athletic venues again in the future. The entire team behind the scenes did another great job this month for you, and we look forward to visiting with you again in October. That's Stand Up and Cheer for the month of September. I'm Russ Eisenstein, and this is Bobcat TV.